So a couple reasons why South Park's use is a fair use. Number one, they have a disclaimer at the beginning of the show, right? All characters, events in the show, even those based on real people and entirely fictional, all are entirely fictional. All celebrity voices are impersonated poorly. The following program contains coarse language and due to its content should not be viewed by anyone. I mean, they're sort of setting it out there, right? You know, they're clearly in this clip, they're making a commentary on um, Disney's corporate control over its content, how D Disney manipulates its audience, like, and using Mickey as a symbol of the company right uh using mickey as a symbol for the control and so um that disney has over its content so in so many ways this is very transformative um but also like you know it's mickey mouse they're referencing but it's clearly not mickey mouse like they borrowed just enough so that you know the um subject of their commentary is is mickey mouse then which is part of a larger um, satire. All right, so this brings us to our first case that I kind of want to talk about here, um, which is uh, Campbell versus Acuff Rose. So this is a 1994 Supreme Court case. Now, um, this is Roy Orbison, uh, you know, who sang a song called uh, Pretty Woman. Oh, Pretty Woman, I believe. So we'll let it, we'll let it play out for a few seconds here. Now, versus uh, Two Live Crew, which was like a Miami booty bass band. They had very explicit sexual lyrics. Luke Skywalker was their, um, which is also interesting, was their lead MC and, and the businessman of the group. Uh, you know, it, actually, very interestingly, um, Two Live Crew went to the Supreme Court twice. Once for, for copyright infringement, infringement, but earlier for First Amendment. So y'all probably can't think think well most of y'all probably have no concept that at one point people could not say what they wanted in music and one point meaning like the early 90s um, where you know specifically uh, rappers and death metal groups and stuff were being censored for their for their content so two life crew ended up going to the supreme court and won on a first on first amendment they also won this case too so they've won twice in supreme court Anyways, they sampled um, a little bit, well, a lot of bit, the recognizable bits, and then interpolated some of the lyrics from Roy Orbison's hit. Now, at the time, Roy Orbison, you know, he was old and, uh, you know, wasn't super active, but the song had been licensed for um, a movie starring Julia Roberts called Pretty Woman, where she was, um, you know, I believe that she was a prostitute and, you know, she meets Richard Gere and like, I don't know, it's just some bullshit Julia Roberts movie. But it was really popular and the theme song was the Roy Orbison song. So that song was like in vogue. Anyways, Two Life Crew did a parody of it where they, where they you know, talk about the, a not so pretty woman. Now, this is the key thing here. Parody does not have to be funny to be parody. Like it still can comment on the original and, and not be funny at all. Um, so let's hear a little bit of that. And so anyways, this ended up in the Supreme, in the Supreme Court, okay? And, um, you know, Two Life Crew used a fair use defense. They basically said, you know, this is a parody. And the issue that Roy Orbison, his publisher, which protects his songwriting, uh, which is, which is Acuff Rose, that they brought up was, you know, um, you know, they use the, the, the most important part, um, they use the most recognizable elements, um, and, you know, uh, he didn't like how they used, used the song, you know, um, for pretty, you know, pretty raunchy, um, you know, no, you know, lyrics. So, uh, Two Life Crew, again, challenged under fair use. Um, they said their work was, was a parody. 
Um, and what ended up, you know, the ruling was in favor of two live crew. So if we look at this kind of, if we want to um, panam it, right? We look at the purpose. Is two live crew simply exploiting pretty woman or are they making a comment on it? Now, if you have a song written about a wholesome, beautiful woman and then a song that is about a not so wholesome, not so beautiful woman, it's clearly, the purpose is commentary. It's building on the original. In fact, the Supreme Court ruled that it was a commentary on the white bread uh, original itself. That's what they said in, in the ruling. Um, now, another major part of purpose was at the time, it was still contested whether uh, you could have a strictly for-profit use be a fair use. Okay, and obviously selling albums is strictly commercial. There's no public interest in that at all, uh, which was a major part that Acuff Rose was pushing, Rory Orbison was pushing. Um, but it, did, it didn't matter. That, that, that became the significance of this case in the ruling was that commercial parodies um, were, were fair use. It didn't matter if, you, if, if it was for profit, it could be a fair use. So I'll talk about that in a second. So um, nature, nature of the original is, is, is Roy Orbison's use, uh, is using Roy Orbison fair or not fair? Well, it's, it's obviously a creative work, so therefore we, we fall in the not fair category. So under purpose, we have fair, it's building upon the original, it's commenting on it directly. Under nature, right, you use a work of, 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 of fiction and therefore creative work, therefore it's not fair. Amount used. They use the most important part most recognizable stuff it was very clearly a riff on it therefore that use would likely be unfair and then we get down to market does it create market harm would someone hear the two live crews you know song and be like wow roy really flipped up his style for the early 90s you know like that probably wouldn't happen um and it doesn't necessarily matter because the work is so transformative in purpose that it ultimately transforms the market, right? Like because they're commenting on it, building upon it, it's a transformative market. The people who are buying, you know, Roy Orbison records are not buying two live crew records and that's patently obvious. So what's the significance of this, right? The significance is that commercial parodies or commercial works could be fair use, like straight up. Before it was contested, like, oh, it's just for profit. Maybe it's not a fair use. After this, it was solidified commercial uses or straight up fair uses, depending on if it was transformative, etc. Uh, they ended up having to pay a license though to Acuff Rose um, because of this. Okay, when you do a parody song, you are making fun of, typically you're making fun of the lyrics. That's a fair use. You typically do your own um, cover of the instrumental composition. So if you think of like what Weird Al does, he usually makes fun of the lyrics, but then he does his own composition of, of the instrumental. Um, you know, for that, using that instrumental, you need to get a, li a license because he's not making fun of the instrumental itself. So most parody songwriters or parody songs get a license uh, for the composition because they are making, um, making fun of only the lyrics. In this case, they sampled the beat and they, um, you know, interpolated the lyrics or made fun of the lyrics. So take a little break. Uh, think about that. Chew on that. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the Betamax.